May the 4th be with you, everyone. If you didn't know, today is Star Wars Day, May 4th. Welcome back to Update X, where I tell you what's been going on in the crazy world of video games over the past week. Also, where my hair is way too long for my own good because of coronavirus. Uploaded every Monday morning on YouTube and podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Today's update 5.1 for May 4th, 2020, which includes the new Assassin's Creed game Valhalla was revealed. The Last of Us 2 getting a release date, along with story spoilers. Don't worry, I'm not going to give any spoilers in my podcast or anywhere else. Finally seeing Xbox Series X gameplay this week, Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest, and so much more, let's get into it. We're going to start with the next Assassin's Creed game, Valhalla, has been revealed. On Wednesday, April 29th, the Assassin's Creed Twitch channel went live with a teaser to what the next Assassin's Creed game would be. It did this by showing a live recording of Boss Logic, creating some art, showing some scenery, and a Viking character in the center, with Assassin's Creed Valhalla written on the character in the center. That was followed up by an announcement saying, Watch the world premiere of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, April 30th. So the next day, the cinematic trailer went live, and let me tell you, I have not enjoyed a trailer this much in a long time. I'm slightly biased because this game is basically tending to all my preferences in combat and history. Um, I'll give a quick overview of the trailer and what was in it. So it starts with a voiceover from a king in England, saying the Vikings are, bar are barbarians in a lot of ways, but the trailer shows the Vikings doing the opposite of what the king is saying. The king says they are godless barbarians, while the Vikings are shown performing a ritual around a wooden statue representing Odin. The king says they murder and kill blindly, while the trailer shows the Vikings raiding a village, but when they come across a woman and child, they stop and tell them to run. It also shows the Vikings play fighting with their children, and then, then the king says, The time has come to speak to them in a language they will understand, while he's writing a declaration of war. The Vikings are then seen beaching their longboats, and they're met with a huge wall of flaming arrows, and the male version of the main character that you play as, Eivor, commands everyone to bring up their shields, and you see some Vikings get hit by arrows falling out of the boat. And then the Vikings storm up the land, and it becomes this huge battle with the Saxons. The fight team's really intense, it's this big epic thing. And the leader of the army sends out some huge warrior with a nod, eventually. And then Eivor sees a hooded man next to a tree in the middle of the battle. And then the man disappears and a raven flies over. And if you didn't know, ravens are a sign of their main god, Odin, in Norse mythology. And Eivor tells the rest of the Vikings on the battlefield, Odin is with us. And then the massive English warrior confronts Eivor 1v1. And the rest of the Vikings and the Saxons end up being in, like, the circle around um, around Eivor and the warrior just watching them fight like it's some big fight club and Eivor basically is getting his ass kicked by this guy the whole time uh, he shoves a sword through the warrior's leg and the warrior just pulls it out like it's nothing and he gets a hold of Eivor and has a sword to his neck and turns back for word from the English commander and then the commander gives a wave telling the warrior to kill Eivor and then you see Eivor raise his arm up and the camera camera angle switches to behind the warrior as the warrior falls to his knees and Eivor pulls out his hidden blade from inside the warrior's helmet and the English commander looks absolutely terrified and it's so great. I was so hyped throughout this whole trailer. I got I got vibes very similar to the Vikings TV series which I loved and Vikings in general are just badass. This is why I was saying it's tending to my preferences in history because I love Vikings. And as far as the combat goes, also tending to my favorite type of combat in a game. It's uh, like sword and shield or any kind of blade and shield, hands down, is my favorite. And that's also a part of why I love 2018's God of War so much. So I'm extremely excited to play this game. And the Ubisoft website has some more details about the game. It starts with build your own Viking legend. Become Eivor, a mighty Viking raider, and lead your clan from the harsh shores of Norway to a new home amid the lush farmlands of 9th century England. Explore a beautiful, mysterious open world, where you'll face brutal enemies, raid fortresses, and build your clan's new settlement, and forge alliances to win glory and earn a place in Valhalla. Lead epic raids. Lead your people in massive assaults against Saxon armies and fortresses, and expand your influence far beyond your settlement's borders. Command a crew of raiders and launch lightning-fast surprise attacks from your longship to claim your enemy's riches for your clan. Visceral Combat 
unleash the ruthless fighting style of a Viking warrior, and dual wield axes, swords, or even shields against fierce, relentless foes. Choose your tactics and dismember opponents in close quarters combat, riddle them with arrows, or assassinate them with your hidden blade. So, dual wielding shields, why? But then again, why not? So you're just running into the battles with the shield on both arms, and that's just the way you're going to do it, I guess. That'll be fun to screw around with. And write your Viking Saga. The advanced RPG mechanics of Assassin's Creed Valhalla give you new ways to grow as a warrior and a leader. Influence the world around you while acquiring new skills and gear to suit your playstyle. Blaze your own path across England by fighting brutal battles and leading fiery raids, or form strategic alliances and triumph by your wits. Every choice you make in combat and conversation is another step on the path to greatness. Grow your settlement. Grow and customize your own settlement by recruiting new clan members and building upgradable structures. Get better troops by constructing a barracks, improve your weapons at the blacksmith, discover new customization options with a tattoo parlor, and much more. Share your custom raider. Create and customize your own mercenary vikings to share online, and reap the spoils when they fight alongside your friends in their own sagas. Recruit mercenaries created by other players and add their strength to your forces. A Dark Age Open World Sail across the icy North Sea to discover and conquer the broken kingdom kingdoms of England. Immerse yourself in activities like hunting, fishing, dice, and drinking games, or engage in t traditional Norse competitions like flighting, I think that's how you say it, or as it's better known, verbally devastating rivals through the art of the Viking rap battle. Now, I don't want to put too much stock into them calling it the Viking rap battle, because I don't know how that's actually going to play out in-game. I was listening to the guys at Kind of Funny talk about it, and someone from Norway or somewhere around there wrote into their show saying it's actually just drunk shit-talking, essentially, but who knows how it's actually going to work in-game. And something crazy about this game is there are 15 development studios working on it. Ubisoft Montreal sent out a tweet thanking the 14 code dev studios. They didn't say who, but that's an insane amount of people working on this game. It's definitely a record for Ubisoft if not a record for any game. The Assassin's Creed Twitter page also said they will reveal their first Valhalla gameplay trailer during the first look Xbox Series X gameplay on Inside Xbox this Thursday, May 7th. That's another story I'm going to talk about later in this episode. Also, Assassin's Creed Valhalla will be a part of Xbox's smart delivery service, so if you buy it for Xbox One, you will not have to buy it again for Xbox Series X, and you will get any kind of upgraded Series X version of it, graphically upgraded or otherwise, for free. The release date is set to holiday 2020. I'm thinking it could be a launch title for the next-gen systems, but Sony and Microsoft haven't given a release date for their systems yet. So if it is a launch title, Ubisoft just isn't really allowed to say when it actually is. It will be available on Xbox Series X, Xbox One, PS5, PS4, PC, and Stadia. I like what they're doing with this as far as giving us information about it. With them randomly coming up with the teaser artwork saying, hey, we're live streaming an artwork piece by Boss Logic out of nowhere. There was no build up to it. And as soon as that was done, they said, tune in tomorrow for the cinematic trailer. So one day after that, we get the trailer. And then them saying, in a week, come back again and you're going to see gameplay for it. I love getting this, all this info for the game this quickly. I don't like waiting a long time in between. Uh, announcements and gameplay and reveals and releases and all that, like, you know, Halo Infinite. Uh, story 2, we've got The Last of Us Part 2's new release date and story spoilers, which also includes Ghost of Tsushima getting pushed back as a result. We're going to start with the leaks, which happened first. The leaked stories from Alex Avard and Connor Sheridan at GamesRadar. More gameplay footage of The Last of Us 2 has been published online, revealing major story spoilers for the upcoming PS4 exclusive including its cutscenes, level lists, and what appears to be the full plot. The footage was quickly taken down by Sony, but fans have provided a full super spoilery breakdown online, because of course they did. First off, if you spoil games or movies for other people before it comes out, you're an ass and shouldn't be online. Uh, especially in this case, this is one of the biggest, most anticipated games in a long time. People have been waiting years for this. And Naughty Dog posted an official message on Twitter the other day, or the day after that, saying, quote, We know the last few days have been incredibly difficult for you. 
We feel the same. It's disappointing to see the release and sharing of pre-release footage from development. Do your best to avoid spoilers, and we ask that you don't spoil it for others. The Last of Us Part 2 will be in your hands soon. No matter what you see and hear, the final experience will be worth it. Originally, there were rumors going around that a disgruntled Naughty Dog employee was the person who put out the leaks, but a story by GamesIndustry.biz by Hayden Taylor says, Sony has confirmed to GamesIndustry.biz that it has identified the primary individuals responsible for the leaks earlier this week, saying they were not affiliated with Sony Interactive Entertainment or Naughty Dog, as was rumored. The publisher declined to comment further, saying that the information was currently subject to an ongoing investigation. And another thing about this came up on Twitter the morning that I was making the podcast, so I didn't have time to put it in my notes. But Jason Schreier, who is a well-known name in the video game journalism industry, put on Twitter, quote, Okay, after talking to two people with direct knowledge of how The Last of Us Part Two leaked, as well as some Naughty Dog employees, I have a good idea of what happened. Short version, hackers found a security vulnerability in a patch for an older Naughty Dog game and used it to access Naughty Dog's servers. He also said, I think the footage that leaked is from devs playing an early build. He says, I haven't watched it. Most importantly, rumors of this being an act of protest by a contractor whose pay was robbed are not true. Naughty Dog actually extended pay and healthcare benefits for contractors due to COVID. So, it's good to hear that it wasn't from a Naughty Dog employee based on just how bad of a deal that would have been. But either way, I'm glad they figured out who it was and that it's not anyone related to Sony or Naughty Dog. And we'll see what kind of legal action they pursue for this. Um, we haven't gotten any news about what they're actually going to do yet. And the next part about the new release date is from Herman Hulst at PlayStation Blog. This also came the day after the leaks. It starts, quote, As we begin to see an ease in the global distribution environment, I am pleased to confirm that The Last of Us Part Two will arrive on June 19th, and Ghost of Tsushima will follow on July 17th. Some people have assumed that PlayStation giving a release date to the game that has been indefinitely, indefinitely delayed until now is because of the story leaks. I think it's just bad timing and partly coincidental. Less than 24 hours after the leaks is not enough time for a new release date to be decided on and announced, I think. It's not enough time for that. It is possible that they weren't planning on announcing the new date yet, and the leaks pushed them to reveal the date earlier, but they had to have been getting close to the, to the announcement either way. In some cases, I would just take this as another release date that will eventually get pushed back yet again. But after the indefinite delay, I really don't think they would have given a new date that they weren't extremely confident and comfortable with. So I'm actually taking these new dates as confirmed, set in stone, and I'm comfortable getting my hopes up for these. I think they're like final and this is going to happen. And some people have also been saying that they should have just waited and made it a launch title for the PS5. The thought did probably cross their minds. Here's my thoughts on it. The game was initially supposed to launch in February of this year, so it was always intended to be released on PlayStation 4, so it won't have all the bells and whistles exclusive to next-gen systems. I think if it did launch with the PS5, it wouldn't showcase the performance of next-generation PlayStation as well as Sony would want it to but there are a dozen reasons in both directions as to why they would or wouldn't just make it a release title. I think it is the right decision to keep trying to push for it to release as soon as possible. And another story that came up last week about The Last of Us 2 was the download size. This is from Jordan Oleman at IGN. The digital download of The Last of Us 2 will require at least 100 gigabytes of hard drive space, and if you didn't already know, the physical release of the game will ship on two discs. Similar to Red Dead Redemption 2, having a data disc and a play disc, so you wouldn't have to switch discs while playing or anything like that. Moving on from that story, we've got the Stadia Connect event last week. I'm getting the details from Chris Carter at Destructoid. Google hosted a special Stadia Connect event on April 28th, which announced 11 games coming to the service. Some are coming sooner than later, so here's a full roundup of what was confirmed. PUBG is probably the crown jewel here. And the Pioneer Edition is arriving today for $39.99, which comes with the Survivor Pass Cold Front as well as exclusive Stadia skins. You can also opt for the $29.99 base game or get it free with your Stadia Pro subscription. 
Google also confirmed that some EA games are coming to Stadia, including Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order coming this fall, Madden coming this winter, and FIFA also coming this winter. There are also going to be some first on Stadia timed exclusives. We've got Krata coming this summer, Get Packed available now, and Wave Break, which release date is yet to be announced. Additional future releases include Zombie Army 4 Dead War, $49.99 or free with Stadia Pro on May 1st, Octopath Traveler, $59.99 available now, Rock of Ages 3 coming in June, and Ember, first on Stadia and PC Early Access starts May 21st. Thumper is cycling out at the end of April, so that's gone now. As a reminder, Stadia is now giving away a free pro trial, so you can give a few of these games a shot at no cost, just remember to cancel if you so choose. My thoughts on the Kinect? Cool. That's basically it. Uh, some more games on the platform. I think for most people there's still just a really bad taste in everyone's mouth from the mass of missteps by Google with their cloud gaming service. But they are getting much better and introducing a free option for Stadia was definitely the right move, as well as giving players two months of their pro membership for free. I would say give it a shot if you've been on the fence about it. What do you have to lose at this point other than time? Just log in with your Google account and play some games. It's essentially just that. Make your own judgments about the service and either cancel after the free membership or buy the pro membership after if you like it. I don't know if I will just because I have way too many games already in a backlog and I really need to start chipping away at that because I still have yet to finish the Final Fantasy VII remake. And the next story we've got a new and very different WWE game coming this fall. It's called WWE Battlegrounds. So IGN released a trailer for the game last Monday, and it looks interesting. I don't even know if I want to use that word. It's definitely different. 2K stated before that there wouldn't be a wrestling sim game this year, and this is definitely not a real realistic wrestling sim game. The game is considered a completely new WWE gaming experience that will feature arcade-style action and over-the-top superstar designs, environments, and moves. The superstars in Battlegrounds just don't look right to me. Honestly, they look like little people. Uh, the first part of the trailer shows The Rock throwing John Cena into the mouth of an alligator. It shows another superstar on fire, another one hitting their opponent with flaming fists. It's very over the top in general. And that's the vibe people like, or some people like, and that's definitely the vibe they were going for. Personally, I just think they took it a little bit too far as opposed to arcade style, but Arcade style is definitely the right term for it. So if you're into this, definitely go for it. The release information for it, all we have is it says it's coming this fall, with more information coming in the next few months. The next story we've got a PS5 reveal set for June 4th, according to a well-known games journalist. I'm getting this from Chandler Wood at PlayStationLifestyle.net. It starts, quote, A new report from games journalist Jeff Grubb of VentureBeat, GamesBeat, says that the PS5 reveal event is currently planned for June 4th. That's just a hair later than the currently rumored May date that dominates most speculation. There's also a question of if Grubb is referring to June 4th as the reveal date itself, or as the date when Sony plans to announce its future plans with the PS5, which could set a full reveal event later. His reply isn't clear, and the wording of the comment he's replying to is debatable. Regardless, his comments take a May PS5 reveal off the table if you want to put stock into what he's saying. What I think about this, PlayStation needs to say something, say anything. Personally, I don't like waiting forever between an announcement and release, as I said before, but it's coming up. They have to show the console soon, and they have to show some gameplay soon. We know what the Xbox console looks like, and we're going to get gameplay for the Xbox Series X on May 7th. So, seeing their console and gameplay before the PS5 even shows us what their console looks like, they gotta pick it up, they gotta do something. Um, Xbox is showing, yeah, the gameplay on May 7th, which is the next story I'm gonna be talking about. And as much of an Xbox guy as I am, I'm planning on getting the PS5 first. I'm thinking of going into the details on my reasoning in another video just to have some more conversation about it. But I just wanna see gameplay and performance from both, so I can know that getting the PS5 first isn't a mistake. And still not seeing any gameplay is killing me, but I am expecting to have seen gameplay from both consoles by the end of June, hopefully. That's my thoughts on where we're going to be at that point. 
and moving on to the Xbox gameplay, Microsoft to demo Xbox Series X games on May 7th. This is from Tom Warren at The Verge. It starts, quote, Microsoft is planning to show off some Xbox Series X gameplay next month. The software maker will hold a special Inside Xbox stream on May 7th, with the focus squarely on games for the Xbox Series X. Microsoft's event will include next-gen gameplay from Microsoft's global developers partners, but Xbox Game Studios games titles will be showcased at a later date. Xbox Game Studio games titles meaning things like Halo Infinite. So this May 7th event will pretty much just be third-party titles and nothing like Halo Infinite or Hellblade 2 or anything like that. But this event strictly being third-party tells us that there's probably another event planned for later that will strictly show first-party titles like Halo Infinite and Hellblade 2, and that event, that event could be crazy. We'll likely see more of Microsoft's own Xbox Series X game plans in June, around the time E3 was supposed to be held. And going on from this, uh, if you haven't seen this Phil Spencer quote from, I think it was last week or something like that, he says, current gen to next gen will be like going from 2D to 3D. That's a big statement, and this is kind of a shorter story, but I just wanted to talk about this for a minute. I'm getting these details from Scott Baird at Screen Rant. So the Screen Rant article starts with, Xbox boss Phil Spencer has claimed that the next generation of consoles will feel as dramatic a change as the jump from 2D to 3D. A lot has been said about what the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X are capable of, but so far it has only really been described in technical language. We haven't seen any physical evidence of the power, but the next generation of we haven't seen any physical evidence of the power of the next generation of consoles, but the head of Xbox is confident that they will see one of the biggest quality upgrades in gaming history. Don't get me wrong, the next gen upgrades will be impressive, but as much of a jump as 2D to 3D, either Phil Spencer doesn't fully understand what that statement he made means. Or he knows something that we don't that's really going to up the scale of video games in the next generation. Specifically in the tweet this is coming from, Phil says, quote, I'm very focused on the work we're doing around dynamic latency input, or DLI. In my view, the feel of games this upcoming generation will change as dramatically as any since 2D to 3D given CPU upgrade, DLI, memory bandwidth, and SSD. Hopefully we see some kind of content like that in the May 7th event showing Xbox Series X gameplay because he's setting expectations really high at this point, so we'll see what happens. Going on from that, we've got the Summer Game Fest 2020 steps in to fill the E3 void for the video games biz. I'm getting this from Todd Spangler at Variety.com. After the video game industry's major E3 event was nixed because of the coronavirus crisis, a new multi-month event has stepped forward to provide an outlet for news, demos, and free playable content. The Summer Game Fest is a four-month series of global events to highlight video games. The season will run from May to August 2020 and feature updates from the following game publishers and platforms. There's a lot of them. We've got 2K, Activision Publishing, Bandai Namco Entertainment, Bethesda, Blizzard Entertainment, Bungie, CD Projekt Red, Digital Extremes, Electronic Arts, Microsoft Xbox, Private Division, Riot Games, Sony Interactive Entertainment, Steam, Square Enix, and Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment. All of these are reportedly just in Phase 1. Also reported is more developers will be revealed in subsequent phases. There hasn't been any word on how many phases this thing's going to be, if they're going to do like one phase a month, or if it's going to be a two-phase thing or what, but we'll see what happens with that as we get closer. The virtual event is the brainchild of industry veteran Jeff Keighley, the creator of the Game Awards, who had attended every E3 since the first one in 1995. But even before E3 nixed plans because of the coronavirus outbreak, he had announced he would not participate in this year's show because he believes in-person events don't serve fans or game publishers as well as an online event could. Keeley told Variety, quote, When you think about it, the idea of consumers waiting in line to play a game at a booth is, antiqu is antiquated, especially with digital distribution. He commented, in these uncertain and challenging times, it's more important than ever that video games serve as a common and virtual connection point between us all. SGF, or Summer Game Fest, 
It is an organizing principle that promises fans a whole season of video game news and other surprises from the comfort of home. For the Summer Game Fest, specific event details will be shared by each game publisher, with additional publishers set to be announced in the coming weeks. As part of the event series, game platforms including Steam and Xbox will offer fans access to playable limited-time demonstrations and trials of select game, co game content. The Steam Game Festival Summer Edition will run June 9th to 14th, with other platform dates to be announced. Programming that is a part of Summer Game Fest will be distributed, distributed across all major streaming platforms, including publisher-owned and operated channels, on Facebook, Mixer, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. Keeley will host special pre- and post-shows for flagship publisher events and partner with IM8Bit to produce a showcase highlighting upcoming games. In addition, on August 24th, Keeley will host and produce Gamescom Opening Night Live, which he's billed as a final er, as a finale to the SGF season. Jeff Keeley hosted a Reddit AMA where he answered some questions about the summer event. So this was a good opportunity to get some more info about the summer game fest. Uh, Reddit user that Jesus hair asked, "Was the summer game fest thought up because of COVID-19, or were you always planning on hosting this event?" Keeley said. COVID-19 accelerated the plans, but the idea of doing a big global digital interactive festival has always been a dream of mine. We sort of started this last year around the Game Awards with the Game Festival. Decent Assistance 5 asked, when will the specific schedule for this be announced? Keeley replied on a rolling basis. So we can't expect a big layout on what will be happening when. We won't get some big calendar with this event's happening this day, this event's happening this day, throughout the entire four-month event. Um, I'm assuming we'll only know about two, maybe three event schedules at a time. And Reddit user Hobrick02 asked, will there be any playable demos for big AAA games? Keeley said, that's a great question. There will be playable content and maybe some big surprises. There are also things like alpha and betas on big games, I would not expect that every major game is going to be doing a demo for you, maybe eventually, but also let's be realistic about the world we are in right now. Work from home is challenging for studios, and they need to finish their games too. But I see a day when, yes, all major games have playable trailers or slices. That's an interesting take by Jeff Keighley. Um, we've seen demos be more and more, or less and less common over the past few years, not like they were on the Xbox 360 where it was very easy to find any given game that has a demo to play. But I haven't really seen many demos come up over the last couple of years in any games. And one question that comes up with the Summer Game Fest is, where's Nintendo? It could be that Nintendo's presence in the Summer Game Fest just hasn't been announced, but with Microsoft and Sony announced right off the bat, Nintendo not being on the list seems kind of weird to me. Nintendo has an open invitation from Keeley to join whenever it pleases. Keeley has said that every publisher is welcome to the Summer Game Fest. And the next piece I'm pulling from Jeff Grubb at VentureBeat. Nintendo has had a June Direct to correspond with E3 every year since 2013. And before that, it held annual stage presentations. But complications brought about from Japan's work from home order as part of its attempts to mitigate COVID-19 are forcing Nintendo to push back its schedule. The last Nintendo Direct was a mini-event in March this year, which wasn't anything too big or crazy, and before that was the normal Nintendo Direct in September of last year. Animal Crossing has been breaking records and selling insanely well, but for the Nintendo fans who aren't in Animal Crossing, and even for Animal Crossing fans, it's been a rough few months. Nintendo hasn't really given much information as far as future plans for new games over the next year, it just feels like a Nintendo drought after Animal Crossing, with no other big games since Pokemon Sword and Shield last year. They've Nintendo's kind of been more quiet than PlayStation recently. Granted, Nintendo isn't launching a new console, so they don't have as much to talk about, but they're saying virtually nothing, and I know some Nintendo fans are frustrated with that. Hopefully they start saying some more soon. And with that, here's a quick update about GDC. Uh, once this year's Game Developers Conference set in March was cancelled, the event organizers said it would be postponed until August. Now they've changed it again, so it will be an all-digital event, still running from August 4th to the 6th. 
GDC will be sharing more information on how to virtually attend at a later date. So we all kind of figured that was going to happen. They were going to end up going digital because when they first announced the August date, they were still planning on it being physical. And going on from all the physical events or digital event stories, Cyberpunk 2077's 18 plus rating leaks in Brazil and a developer says, we don't fuck around. This is from Andy Chalk at PC Gamer. Last week, Brazil's advisory rating system let slip that CD Projekt's upcoming RPG, Cyberpunk 2077, will be rated 18 plus in the country. The listing was quickly taken down, but not before it was recorded for posterity on Reddit, which captured images of the rating and provided a handy translation of the content list too. Some of the translations are a little rough, but there's no mistaking that the list is comprehensive, with features ranging from foul language and blood to mutilation, intense sexual relations, suicide, and cruelty. Mitigating factors are, according to the listing, nothing. While drug consumption and, quote, intense sexual relationships, which Andy Chalk suspects might be more accurately translated to graphic rather than intense, but that's what Google, Google Translate said, those are the aggravating factors. The bottom line is that, in Brazil at least, Cyberpunk 27, 2077 is not recommended for under 18. And one thing to keep in mind, other games rated 18 plus in Brazil, according to Video Game Geek, include Beyond Two Souls, God of War Ascension, Fallout New Vegas, Call of Juarez, and most of the GTA games, so it might not be as graphic as this article makes it seem, but I think they'll still be pushing it. CD Projekt hasn't officially commented on the leak, but lead quest designer Paul Sasko uh, expressed some personal thoughts about the leak on Twitter that certainly make it appear legitimate. After someone tweeted a list of the reasons for the 18 plus rating, Sasko retweeted it and said, you surprised? We don't fuck around. So I think he's kind of proud of that. <laughs> like some of the devs are kind of proud of how far they're pushing Cyberpunk 2077. The ESRB, PEGI, and the Australian Classification Board don't have ratings listed publicly for the game yet, and it will be very interesting to see where it ultimately ends up on their charts. The studio said late last year that the game will feature motion-captured sex scenes in first person, no less. And I, not me, Andy Chalk, right? Andy Chalk was the one who wrote this? Yeah. Um, and Andy Chalk wondered at the time how that would square with the ESRB's adult-only age rating, or AO, Generally speaking, the ESRB is okay with violent content, but sex is an entirely different matter. The mature rating, or M, allows for sexual content, but graphic sexual content will get you the AO. And that's a big problem for game makers trying to reach mass markets. Anything goes on Steam, but major retailers won't stock AO games, and neither Xbox Live nor the PlayStation Store will allow them either. That's why even envelope-pushing developers like Rockstar work so hard to squeeze their games into the M category. If you want to sell your game to anything beyond a niche audience, you simply cannot carry an AO rating. So, again, I think Brazil's rating is a little bit different from ours, so I don't think it'll be that bad, but it'll still be up there on the M rating. And that's it for the news this week. Going on to gaming deals, you can still get Pac-Man Championship Edition 2 for free to keep on Xbox, PlayStation, and Steam until May 10th. And a reminder that Red Dead Redemption 2 is coming to Game Pass for console on May 7th, replacing Grand Theft Auto V. And the games with Xbox Live Gold for May are V-Rally 4, which is available from May 1st to May 31st, Warhammer 40,000 Inquisitor Martyr, available May 16th to June 15th, Sensible World of Soccer, available May 1st to May 15th, Overlord 2, available May 16th to May 31st, and there's a Golden Week sale for Xbox going on this week with up to 60% off games like Earth's Dawn, Monster Hunter World Iceborne, Dead or Alive 6, Dead Rising 1, and Dead Rising 2. Uh, the Dead Rising games are actually 70% off, so the description of the sale is lying. And more. There are a ton of deals on Star Wars games for Star Wars Day, which is May 4th. Amazon has Jedi Fallen Order for $30. That deal might only be, be available today, I'm not sure, and didn't have a end date listed for that. A ton of discounts on Star Wars games on Steam until May 7th, 
including a bundle with 26 Star Wars games, which is a $292 value that you can get for $76.86. There are deals on a bunch of Star Wars games on the Xbox Store ending today. Uh, Star Wars games on sale on the Nintendo eShop until May 6th, and a bunch of Star Wars games game sales on the PlayStation Store until May 13th. Except for Jedi Fallen Order. The PlayStation sale for that ends May 5th. PlayStation's Big in Japan sale is still going on until May 8th, which includes Final Fantasy VIII Remastered, Devil May Cry 5 Deluxe Edition, One Punch Man and Hero Nobody Knows, the Yakuza Remastered Collection, and more. The PlayStation Plus games for May are Cities Skylines and Farming Simulator 19. A lot of people are very upset about this month's lineup for PS Plus games, uh, especially considering there were rumors going around that the games this month were going to be Dying Light and Dark Souls Remastered. But at least we got Uncharted 4 last month, as well as the Play at Home initiative, where you can get Journey and Uncharted the Nathan Drake Collection for free until May 5th still. And I'm so curious to see if PlayStation is going to extend their Play at Home initiative and offer two more games after the Nathan Drake Collection and Journey are done on May 5th. Deals for Nintendo, they also have a Golden Week sale, with sales on games like God Wars The Complete Legend, Penny Punching Princess, uh, The Longest Five Minutes and more through May 10th, Deadly Premonition Origins is half price through May 17th, there are also random deals right now on games like Overcooked 2, Splatoon 2, Monstrum, Megabyte Punch, and more. And on to releases from past week and next week via Metacritic. The narrator is a dick, longer, harder, and uncut, available April 20th for PC. OMG Police Car Chase TV Simulator came out April 20th for Switch. Stranded Deep came April 21st for PS4 and Xbox. XCOM Camera Squad, April 23rd for PC. MotoGP 20, April 23rd for PS4, Xbox, Switch, and PC. Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 4, Road to Baruto, April 24th for Switch. Trials of Mana, April 24th for PS4, Switch, and PC. Deliver Us the Moon, April 24th for PS4 and Xbox. Doug Hates His Job, April 24th for Xbox. Predator Hunting Grounds, April 24th for PS4 and PC. I've seen a lot of people having a lot of fun with that game over the past week. Telling Lies, April 28th for PS4, Xbox, and Switch. Remnant from the Ashes, Swamps of Cross, April 28th for PC. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, New Power Awakens Part 1, April 28th for PS4, Xbox, and PC. Moving Out, April 28th for PS4, Xbox, Switch, and PC. Snow Runner, April 28th for PS4, Xbox, and PC. Gears Tactics, April 28th for PC. And if you have Game Pass for PC, you can get that game for free. But even with that deal, a ton of people are buying it on Steam. When it launched, it was the top-selling Steam game right away for that day. Uh, Daymare 1998, April 28th for PS4 and Xbox. The Inner Friend, April 28th for Xbox. Dread Nautical, April 29th for PS4, Xbox, Switch, and PC. The Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remaster, April 30th for Xbox and PC. Streets of Rage 4, April 30th for PS4, Xbox, Switch, and PC. So this next game that I talked about last week, uh, each sale I drank a glass of water. It was supposed to go into early access on May 1st, but as of May 2nd, it still says coming soon, so it might not actually be happening. And going on to games coming this next week, World War Z Game of the Year Edition, May 5th for PC, Xbox, and PS4. John Wick Hex, May 5th for PS4. Close to the Sun, May 5th for PC. Jay and Silent Bob Mall Brawl, May 7th for Switch. Megabyte Punch, May 8th for Switch, which was also in the Nintendo Deals section of this episode. And a little bonus future release I wanted to include here. Remember that 2005 game, Destroy All Humans? If you didn't know, it's getting a remake. So, the same developer, same publisher, fully re-envisioned and recreated. It's set for release on July 28th for PC, on Steam, and PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, the standard edition of the game is going to be $40. If you've never heard of the game or don't remember it, you take on the role of evil alien Crypto-137. Your objective is to harvest DNA and take down the US government to complete the legendary alien invasion. On your way there, annihilate puny humans using an assortment of alien weaponry and psychic abilities. Reduce their cities to rubble with your flying saucer. 
Uh, they do have pre-orders open for the remake. As I said, the standard edition is $40, and they have two special editions of the game, which are pretty expensive if you want that. Um, the DNA Collector's Edition, which includes a glow-in-the-dark crypto and cow figurine that's nine inches tall, an eye-popping anti-stress toy, all in-game crypto skins, six lithographs, and a keychain that bundles $150, and the Crypto 137 Edition, which includes a figurine of Crypto 137 that's 23 inches tall, the eye-popping anti-stress toy, the in-game crypto skins, the six lithographs, the keychain, and a crypto backpack. That edition is $400. So, if you really like the Royal Humans, get that one. Oh, the, uh, did I say the date? Yeah, July 28th is the date for that remake. Moving on to what have I been playing. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, I've still been chipping away at. Still love that game. Uh, the Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remaster, I jumped into April 30th. I feel like either the game doesn't hold up that well, or it was better than I remember it being. Or, yeah, I remembered it being better, because, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right to me. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, more Rocket League, of course. And a little bit of Halo Master Chief Collection and Halo 5 with the guys from the Finish the Fight podcast. Uh, they had another game night on Saturday which where they just host a game night and play random game modes and party games on Halo. If you like Halo, check out the podcast Finish the Fight on podcast platforms and YouTube. They do so much good research into the games, the books, the lore, everything Halo. I love it. So this has been your update 5.1 for May 4th, 2020. Thank you so much for watching on YouTube or for listening on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you want to get more frequent gaming news posts from me in between episodes, you can follow the show's page on Twitter at UpdateXShow. You can also give me any feedback or suggestions you have about the show while you're there. Outside of game news, I post gaming clips for fun on TikTok at TheOnlyRush, if you want to check that out. And my personal Twitter page is also at TheOnlyRush, where I post non-strictly news-related stuff. As always, thank you so much for choosing UpdateX for your gaming news. I'll see you next Monday morning. Have a great week.